right now, Pittsburgh's best sports show is about to begin. Call us or tweet us. We've got things to talk about on the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Call. Good evening, everyone. Welcome inside the Fan Cave. Bob Pompiani greeting you tonight. Hope you stick with us until 11 o'clock at 412-575-2600. That's the number of the hotline here on the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Call. Joined tonight with Mr. Chris Muller. Joins us up in 93.7 The Fan. Um, and Chris, a big conversation over the last couple of year, uh, days has been the situation on Sunday when David Bednar came into the game uh, and blew a third save so far this season. A lot of people didn't like what was happening with the fan base, booing him, and then it was, um, you know, Rowdy Tellez who came into the locker room and, and felt the need to go up to him. I, I was a little surprised by that because, you know, David Bednar knows what it's like to be a, a, a closer. I mean, he was ready to answer questions, and he eventually did. Uh, it is, you know, one of those situations that you have to certainly monitor if you're Derek Shelton and, and maybe make some short-term adjustments, but by no means should anyone think that he's done as a closer or, or has lost something. I don't know what the reason is, but your whole thoughts about that situation on Sunday. Well, I have a lot of them, Bob, so I guess buckle up here. I'll try to be as quick as I can because uh, I know we don't, we're limited on time, I know. Always. Uh, first and <laughs> foremost, first and foremost, uh, if it's not injury related, uh, I almost kind of hope it was or it had been because his command being that off almost has me worried on a fundamental level. Like they don't seem worried, so I'm not going to get too worried yet. But I, I almost wish there was like some minor tweak or injury that could explain it a little more easily than this, this guy just can't find his release point. So to me, that's the main story is that David Bednar was supposed to be a huge part, maybe the biggest part of their biggest weapon, which is their bullpen, and it is significantly diminished uh, until and if he, he finds himself again. It's good that they have a luxury item in Chapman who can clearly close games out as a better closer than Bednar, but you'd like to get Bednar back. So that's one thing. Two is Derek Shelton sort of taken him out earlier. I think Derek Shelton absolutely deserves some criticism for the way he handled that situation. Three. I think booing discourse, to boo or not to boo, is some of the dumbest talk that we can produce. However, Bob, that is not an indictment of us talking about it. The fact that people did it and people got mad about it means we need to talk about it. And I'll never pass up a chance to roll around in the mud with everybody else, even if I think we should all be collectively above such things. Therefore, let me offer this formal statement. If you bought a ticket to the game, while I think we would all understand what the, the list of boorish behaviors is that you shouldn't engage in and that should be universally condemned, booing is not one of them. If you were booing because you were simply disappointed that the two-time All-Star closer looked terrible and turned a 3-1 to one loss in, or a 3-1 to one win into a 5-3 to three loss in a very short span of time, I would agree with you. And I thought Rowdy Telez... The, the sentiment of we believe in this guy and he's going to get back to his usual self, don't worry about it, we're good and he's good, is a nice sentiment. But the fact that he did it in front of the cameras, I thought was a look at me moment. And pretty rich that a guy who's been here for 20 minutes is telling lifelong Pittsburghers what we are or aren't all about in this city. Uh, so I didn't like that one bit. I frankly don't like being lectured by media, other players, other fans about whether I should boo somebody or not based on how much they have or haven't done for a team. Yeah, that only, is the, the most concise concern. way I can present it all, Bob. The only thing I'd say about it is that I would have had a quicker hook with him just given what he had done in the previous outings. And whatever he's struggling with, if it's not an injury, then they have to work it out. I would have gone to Chapman and they had a day off today, which makes me wonder why Chapman wasn't even up in that situation. Real quick, let's get uh, Penguins situation. Four games left across the board for all these teams. Washington controls the destiny. If they win out, they're going to get in, and the Penguins won't. Nobody else will unless you catch the Islanders then, who also won yesterday. What's the best way in, and what do you think is going to happen, uh, not just tomorrow, but the rest of the way? I don't think Washington's going to win out. I do think the Penguins have a very realistic chance to win out. Uh, I think that they are still playing pretty good hockey. I thought Toronto just showed that they're a very gifted offensive team, but the Penguins were pretty dogged in that game and were opportunistic in the third. Uh, I absolutely think, as daunting as Boston can be, that they can beat them. The Red Wings just got beat by the Capitals, so I feel good about tomorrow night. I think they can beat Boston. I think they can beat Nashville. And then... Stop me if you've heard this one before. Maybe it all comes down to Penguins Islanders uh, winning your in. 
Uh, more funny would be if it came down to Penguins Islanders. Hey, if you guys just make it to overtime, you're both in, which I still think is plausible. Can you imagine if we just get two teams circling around each other, not really trying to play hockey for 60 minutes? The NHL would make sure that never happened again. Yeah. But I, I have a weird gut feeling, Bob, they're going to get in, actually. I think they're probably yeah. going to win out. I hope so. I'd love to see it because playoff hockey is something to be enjoyed for sure. And by the way, Detroit, uh, they ran into Charlie Lindgren, who played his best game as a capital for my money. He made 42 saves out of 43 shots. And that's what it takes sometimes in this type of uh, down the stretch. you got to get goaltending. And the Penguins have gotten it with Nadalkovich. We'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, coming off a loss. Uh, that will be interesting indeed. We're going to take a break here. Come back with your phone calls. It's 412-575-2600. This is the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Call. We're live on KDK Plus and on the radio. It's 93.7 The Fan. Welcome back, our GMC Sierra. Tweet of the night is the Masters Champion Dinner menu provided by John Rahm, who's the defending champ. A lot of Spanish delicacies, including some Spanish wine on there. Uh, and I'm sure they did it beautifully <laughs> down there because they have some of the best chefs in the world. Uh, all right. Let's talk about this a little bit, Chris, because we have all these tweets coming in, people wanting to know about picks uh, concerning this field. And one of our tweeters, if I can call this up real quick, had an interesting thing to say about who his pick is. And he considers, says Zach Williams on Twitter, uh, it looks like Scotty Scheffler, it's his to lose, but I look at Wyndham Clark as my dark horse, he says. I, first of all, I don't look at him as a dark horse. Uh, I think Wyndham Clark's been good. Think about Scheffler. He, like, uh, there are a couple of guys who are expecting their first child any time. And he could end up, and he said, whenever it happens, he's leaving. And wouldn't it be something if you bet on him and it's Sunday morning and he's gone? Too bad. He'd get so much hate for that from the people who bet on him, but those people would be gigantic losers. I resp Everything I've read about the guy really does suggest that golf's just one part of his life. He's extremely family-oriented, which I think is very laudable. Uh, he's so good that he probably could just leave and say, eh, I'll win two or three more along the way. Uh, he is, I think, the obvious and correct favorite. If he putts at all, he's probably going to win. Bob, I'll get in a little, a little in the weeds here with you. I don't love Wyndham Clark at this tournament. You want to know why? Why? Because Wyndham Clark loves to move the ball left to right as a right-hander. And what do we know about most of the big holes at Augusta? It favors guys from the right side who can draw the golf ball. Uh, and Wyndham Clark's shot, not that it's a huge issue with these guys. They hit it so far, but he likes to fade the golf ball. I'll give you one. This guy just switched from a blade putter to, I think, a mallet, sort of similar to what uh, Scheffler did. Uh, give me Brooks Kepka. Now, the, the switch in putters, I think he went 69, 77, 77, but I think Brooks Kepka is going to show up like he does at most majors, play very well, and be right there down the stretch. And he is right now my pick to win. Yeah, well, you couldn't go wrong with him. He has five majors looking for number six. As far as my pick, I'm going to go the other way, a lefty, Brian Harmon, because he plays that fade for him, which will you know help him out in that situation. He's also a grinder. He takes a little too long for me. He drives me nuts with how many times he milks the club <laughs> on the way back. However, those around him will be tortured and probably fall uh, off because he's playing <laughs> with Brian Harmon. He's going to what is he going to do? Annoy them right out of the tournament, maybe Bob? So, is that maybe what you're going so. with but there here? Is, hey, listen, there's weather tomorrow. That, that could be a big problem anyway. Let's get we're running short on time as we always do. Let's get a Dave in the north side who's first up tonight. What's up, Dave? <laughs> I like to see Pirates get another left-hand batter. That's what they need. They need another left-hand batter. There's too many righties on, on our team right now. What do you think about that, Bob? Well, what, what spe uh, I was going to say, what specifically are looking to get here? You know, Cruz is a lefty. Reynolds is a lefty. Sawinski is a lefty. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think that's their issue at Telez all. Telez is I, a lefty, and Telez has yeah. hit 35 home runs. Like, their, their best three power guys are all left-handed bats primarily. Rowdy Telez might hit 20-plus home runs. He's a left-hander. What's the guy want? Ken Griffey Jr., <laughs> Barry Bonds coming back? What do we want, a lineup of all left-handed hitters? I don't know. I, I think they have enough lefties. they got to just hit better with runners in scoring position. They've scored a lot of runs, but they've also left a lot on base so far. Let's go to Chuck in Uniontown. Hello, Chuck. Good evening, fellas, and thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think, in light of yesterday's heartbreaking loss, that this team is better psychologically uh, fit to bounce back from a bad loss like that because I'm thinking with this road trip to Philadelphia and New York coming up that if 
they lose a couple more like that, you know, if they lose like three in Philadelphia, the thing might start festering. You might start thinking it's a repeat of last year. Do you think no, that's I, 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 Chuck, I think it's too early for any of that. I really do. It's one game. I, you know, these guys are big guys. They've been around. They've only played 12 games at this point. So, no, there is. They had a day off today. They probably could shake it off, get at it tomorrow. If, you know, is it Jared Jones tomorrow? I didn't even check who's starting. I would imagine it's his turn in the rotation, Chris. Uh, but if they win tomorrow and they do some, you'll know, forget about that the other day. I mean, I think psychological stuff like that is overrated. The Orioles lost a couple of heartbreakers to the Pirates, and then they got back on the horse. Now, granted, they're a better team, uh, but I do think that kind of thing festers with Pirates fans because of some of the collapses this team has had. But if they have a tough stretch in Philly and New York, it'll be because they're playing good baseball teams. But no, I actually, I don't think this is going to last. I think one thing that'll insulate them is. When it gets down, if they have a lead in the, in the ninth inning, they can go to a guy who saved over 300 games and has bl- been blowing people away all year. I think that's going to be a big help to them not having to trot Bednar back out there while he sorts out his issues with command. By the way, Zach Williams writes in Jackson Holiday, the number one prospect in all of baseball, made his debut tonight for the Orioles. They called him up. Quick track through the minors, and we'll see what they got. They got a lot of young talent there. Back to the lines. we got Big Tony <laughs> in Greensburg. What's up, Big Tony? Hey, how you guys doing tonight? Good. Hey, I know you guys both follow the NBA. I was just curious. I see this uh, there's a group uh, studying professional NBA team here in Pittsburgh. How would you think they would do here? I think it would do pretty good, especially if you had like a team like Minnesota with Anthony Edwards or something like that, or a team that won an yeah, NBA championship. Yeah, but it would depend on how the NBA, if you're talking about an expansion franchise, you know, if they got the NHL treatment and you got a whole bunch of people in here who can play right away, that'd be different, I suppose. I just think it'd be challenging economically, corporate, you know, corporate support, given you know what this market is and how many professional teams there are. I think it'd be tough to do, but I would love it. I'd love to watch these guys come in, and uh, for that matter, I think there's a better chance that WNBA would come here than the NBA. Chris, what do you think? I think there's probably a better chance the WNBA would come here, and if they had Caitlin Clark, they'd probably pack them in and, and do good ratings because she's must-see TV. Uh, If you wanted an NBA team here, simple trade. You'd have to get rid of the hockey team. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, It's one or the other in a a market this size. It's one or the other. The Penguins obviously hugely successful because they won. If an NBA team came here in a parallel universe and there was no hockey team and that NBA team won two or three titles in a 10-year span, newsflash, they'd be very popular as well. Yeah, no question about that. But I think it's just too... Uh, too little corporate support to, to support all these franchises at the same time. George. Not enough population, Bob. Yeah, George in the Beaver County area is on the air. What's up, George? Hi, guys. Uh, appreciate you taking my call. Uh, sure. the, the, uh, the, the issue with uh, David Bednar is what I want to speak with briefly. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I don't understand why, with his struggling, blowing three saves, they have a Hall of Fame closer in Aroldis Chapman, why not just put a role to Chapman in the closer position, take David Bednar out of the equation, let him work his problems out, and bring him back in when you know he can be effective? I think that's what's going to happen, actually. It's a good point, George. I think if you're Derek Shelton tomorrow and the next day and in this series, I think that'll be the way to go uh, for whatever's ailing David Bednar. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm sure he'd understand it. Uh, and eventually he'd like to get back to that role, and I think he would. Well, quickly here, I'll just say this. You know how we always lament the fact that in hockey, Bob, if a guy lays a vicious hit but there's no injury that results from the play, even if the intent of the hit was really bad, the player often won't get Mm -hmm. suspended very much, if at all. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, absolutely. So my problem with Shelton and the way he handled this is Bednar already blew two saves. The Pirates just happened to rally to win both of those baseball games. And I think if he had blown two saves and they had lost both times, he wouldn't have gotten a chance to close that game out. But that's bad praxis if you're if you're Derek Shelton. He blew two saves. The opportunity was there to maybe cool cool your jets a little bit and just go to Chapman, who had only thrown seven pitches the previous night. That's where I think Derek Shelton aired here. Yeah, I don't have a, any problem uh, with going from Perez through eight innings to Bednar. That's the way it worked a lot last year, and if it works this time, we're not even talking about any of this. It didn't work. There were a lot of people who felt, and we have two um, – People from Twitter, one is named Colonel, the other is named Roger, who say that Perez should have gotten the opportunity to go out in the ninth. Now listen, it's 100 pitches early in the season. Again, when you have 
guys like Chapman and Benton are out there and that's the way it goes, I'm not going to be critical. I am going to be critical that he didn't react quickly enough when Bednar was clearly not locating. Yeah, I mean, that was a bad part, but I'll just go back to what I said. You should react quicker once you realize your guy doesn't have it and he lets him die on the vine. But again, Bednar had already blown two saves. I know it would have made it look very suspicious or people would have started to chatter about whether he was going to lose his job had he sent Chapman out there. But there was reason to believe Bednar was going to struggle because he hasn't had what I would call an extremely clean outing yet all year, maybe one of them. Uh, so I think you can find original sin there on Derek Shelton's part, just trusting a guy who maybe hadn't earned that trust this season yet. But real quick, would you have sent Perez out for inning number nine? There's not one part of me that thought that was going to happen. Did you at the time when it was so going my or on? My order of operations here, my preferred order of outcomes would have been you send Chapman out there because I think he wipes them out. You send Perez back out there and you send Bednar. You want to accuse me of doing the old hindsight's 2020 thing? Fine, but Perez was mowing guys down. Chapman's been literally unhittable all year. Those would have been my first two options for that ninth inning. Well said. We're going to take a break, come back with more. This is the Ireland Contracting Nightly Sports Call. We're live on KDKA Plus and 93.7 The Fan. Ethan Morton out of Butler, four years at Purdue, where he was a starter last year. He was on the bench this year. He's transferring, which is not a surprise for one final year. And John Calipari made his uh, Razorback debut at a press conference. And the first thing he said was, <laughs> he said, I address the team. There is no team. <laughs> so he's getting a whole bunch of recruiting going on or spending money, whatever they're going to do out there. I, were you surprised to see this whole thing play out to go to from Kentucky to Arkansas? A little bit. I mean, Arkansas loves its basketball, too. And he had that sort of quote unquote lifetime deal that Mitch Barnard gave him at Kentucky. So it is a little strange. But I, I, I do think. He's a human being at the end of the day, and I think even if you're making gobs of money at that tradition-laden program, the pressure that fans are putting on you and the unhappiness might weigh on you, and he just kind of bolted. He's got to figure out a way to just coach guys up better because that's an indictment on him that he has so much talent and they underachieve. As for Ethan Morton, you think he might look good on a roster like Duquesne's big athletic guard, maybe not the best shooter, but can D people up and do all the little things that a basketball yeah, team needs? I would do that it. might not be a bad fit. Come home to end it, yes. All right, that's going to do it for us. We're coming home soon. <laughs> Chris, you'll be there before I will. Uh, I got to still do the news here at KDKA, so I look forward to that. Thank you for joining us. We're back on the air tomorrow at 1035. Have a good evening.